three more things about conjunctive adverbs before we talk about the homework. So first of all, one conjunctive adverb that we did not discuss last week is for example. For example is also one of these conjunctive adverbs. And this is something that many Taiwanese students misuse, not even just Taiwanese students. Many people, including native speakers, misuse this term. If in a sentence your example is not a complete sentence, then the term, for example, functions as a subordinate conjunction, uh, not a subordinate conjunction, as um, a preposition. So in this sentence, um, the example is just a noun, so it it's not up to the clause or sentence level. But if your example is an entire sentence, the Hunger Games is a good series, this is a complete sentence, then for example functions as a sentence adverb. So you can either separate this into two different sentences, or you can use a semicolon to make it one sentence. But if you write something like this, and your example is a complete sentence, this cannot just be a comma, because you're connecting to complete sentences. And as we've said, you cannot complete to connect to complete sentences with only one comma. Another conjunctive adverb that is quite unique is besides. Now, many of you will think that besides just means in addition to. That's wrong. Besides is a kind of addition that turns from active to passive sense. So you have a uh, your first point before besides is a solid concrete reason, and the point that you add after besides is a secondary, less important reason. In Chinese, we call this he kuang. So in this example, again, uh, it can function either as a sentence adverb, beginning a new sentence, or as a conjunctive adverb with a semicolon. So in this sentence, we should take the stairs today because the elevator is broken. Besides, it can give us some exercise. So the first reason the elevator is broken is the primary reason. This reason alone makes it a good idea to use the stairs. But if you have a secondary reason, you can use besides to introduce the less important reason. So the word besides should not simply be used like moreover or in addition to. Besides is a specific conjunctive adverb that turns from primary to secondary reason. And then the last point, we have been putting these conjunctive adverbs at the beginning of a sentence. But because their original function is as a sentence adverb that describes the entire sentence, you can actually put it in many different places in the second half of this sentence. So this is what we've been doing, putting it at the beginning of the second sentence. It's too expensive, but you can put it in the middle. It is, however, too expensive. You can even put it at the end. It's too expensive, however and these meanings are all the same. And notice that in each case we are connecting them with semicolons. Uh, now you might have noticed that in these two examples I use the contraction it's, but in the middle example I expanded this to it is. Um, this has to do with what we're going to talk about today, which is the shape and elegance of the sentence style. 
it sounds odd to a native speaker of English if you pause a sentence right after a contraction. Contractions are able to be contracted because they are less important words, because they are not emphasized. But usually whatever we say just before the end or just before a pause should be emphasized. Let me say that in a different way. When you put something just before the end or just before a pause, that position emphasizes the word. So it doesn't make sense to put a contraction here because we're not supposed to emphasize a contraction. So I have expanded it in this example. OK, do you have questions about these three points? Great, let's look at the homework, page 27. Starting from number two. Frank has an excellent memory, comma, but he doesn't use it to good advantage. This is a very interesting use of the word to. To your advantage, to good advantage, to your benefit. I'll use the word to. Number three, Marta was having trouble remembering things, comma, so she signed up for a memory course. Four, Marta was having trouble remembering things. Semicolon, fen hao. And then consequently, comma, she signed up for a memory course. Consequently is not a coordinate conjunction. It is in fact a conjunctive adverb. So the punctuation is different. Five, you need to start taking better notes. Conjunctive adverb, so in front you put a semicolon. And then behind you put a comma. Otherwise you won't do well on the exam. In fact, you can hear the semicolon and you can hear the comma when you read the sentence. Listen, you need to start taking better notes. Otherwise you won't do well on the exam. You can hear the different length of pause before and after the word otherwise. Six, you need to start taking better notes or you won't do well on the exam, comma. Seven, I have difficulty remembering people's names, comma, yet I can always remember what they were wearing. Eight. I have difficulty remembering people's names. Semicolon. On the other hand, comma. I can always remember what they were wearing. Number nine, Amanda forgot to pay her bill, comma. So the power company turned off her electricity. Ten, Amanda forgot to pay her bill. Semicolon. Therefore, comma. The power company turned off her electricity. Questions about this page? All right, next page, 28. One, I was exhausted, comma, so I went to bed at 8 p.m. You can also pay attention to how we write the time. If you're using 12 hour time, you have to write a.m. or p.m. Usually there is a space between the number and the AM or PM, and it's P dot M dot with no space in the middle. Same for AM, A dot M dot, no space in the middle. Uh, do you guys know why we say AM and PM? So these are from the Latin. AM is anti-meridian and PM is post-meridian. Meridian means the middle. Anti means before, post means after. The middle here just means the middle of the day, noon. So AM means before noon, PM means after noon. So now you know. 
Number two, I visited many exotic places. Semicolon. For instance, which means, for example, comma. I've been to Bali, Marrakesh, and Tasmania. Uh, Marrakesh is in Morocco, Morocco. Where's Tasmania? It's an island off the coast of Australia. Three, we need to remember to get tickets, semicolon, otherwise, comma, we won't get seats. Four, Nora forgot her passport, semicolon, as a result, comma, she missed her flight. Five, even though Bao has a degree, comma, he has a low paying job. So Bao has it, sorry, Bao has a degree. This is a complete sentence. But when you add even though to the front, it turns the entire part into a subordinate clause, fu shu zi ju. So it's no longer complete. When you say even though, we're expecting the other half of the sentence. So this part is no longer complete. Uh, so the main sentence begins here. This is the subject. And before this, we have to add a comma. Six, as soon as I got off the train, comma, I took a taxi to the hotel. Same reason, as soon as, therefore, we're waiting for the second half, which begins with the subject I, and before this, we add a comma. Seven, you're too young to have a car, semicolon, besides, comma, cars are very expensive. We see here once again the use of besides to connect a primary reason to a secondary reason. The primary reason, the person is too young. The secondary reason, which we can think of as even if they are not too young. Secondary reason, cars are very expensive. Questions about these seven? All right. Uh, OK, conversation has five mistakes. A, I heard you're taking a memory improvement course. Semicolon or period. Uh, depends on if you want to keep it one sentence or two sentences. And of course, if you add a period, the H should be capitalized. Dashi. How's it coming along? B, the course itself is fine, although it's pretty expensive. It's worth it. OK, so it looks like these two should be part of the same sentence, right? Although it's pretty expensive, it's worth it. And uh, because it begins with although, it is not a complete sentence. So uh, we take out this comma. This comma is extra. And we turn this into a comma and lowercase i. And then we don't need everything here, right? It's worth it. End of sentence. A. I've been thinking about taking one too, semicolon or period. However, I wonder if I would really learn anything. Would you recommend your course? B. Yes, I would. OK, so this is not uh, for introduces a reason, but in this case, the reason comes in front, right? The reason is, yes, I would recommend the course. The effect is why don't you sign up? So this should be so. Yes, I would. So why don't you sign up? Is that five? One, two, three. Oh, yeah, that's around five. OK, questions? All right, let's keep going. Punctuate and add capital letters. And two of them are perfect. OK. Because it was cold, comma, she wore a coat. She wore a coat because it was cold. Good. Because of the cold weather, comma, she wore a coat. She wore a coat because of the cold weather. Good. The weather was cold. Semicolon, therefore, comma, she wore a coat. 
The weather was cold, semicolon. She wore a coat, therefore. As we just discussed, this is fine. You can move the therefore around. And number seven, the weather was cold, comma, so she wore a coat. Questions? All right, 29, page 29. Punctuation, capital letters. OK, number one, Pat always enjoyed studying sciences in high school, semicolon, therefore, comma, she decided to major in biology in college. Two, due to recent improvements in the economy, comma, fewer people are unemployed. Three, Last night's storm damaged the power lines, semicolon. Consequently, comma, the town was without electricity. Four, due to the snowstorm, comma, only five students came to class, semicolon. The teacher therefore canceled the class. I'm going to say add a comma before and after therefore. So the teacher, comma, therefore, comma, Canceled the class. Really, these kinds of adverbs technically should come at the very end of a sentence. So if they are anywhere except the end, you should add a comma to tell the reader that the position has been moved. Or two commas if it's in the middle. Questions about these four? All right, next uh, set. Commas, periods, capital letters don't change the words. OK, got it. Number two, Anna's father gave her some good advice, comma, but she didn't follow it. Three, even though Anna's father gave her some good advice, comma, she didn't follow it. Four, Anna's father gave her some good advice, semicolon. She did not follow it, however. Five, Thomas was thirsty. I'm going to say period. Uh, and then here I'm going to say semicolon. Here's the thing. These are three complete sentences. Thomas was thirsty is a complete sentence. I offered him some water is also a complete sentence. And then he refused it is a third complete sentence. So technically in between these three sentences, you can all use semicolons. So semicolon here, semicolon there. You can also just cut the sentences up, period, capital letter, period, capital letter. But it seems to me that these three sentences are not equally related. It seems like two of these sentences are more closely related than. Uh, so here's what I'm thinking. I think these two sentences are more closely related than these two sentences. Because uh, like Thomas was thirsty, cool. And then I offered him some water. It seems like there's a, a kind of a, a bigger gap. There's more of a thought process. There's more of a transition between these two sentences. But when I offer him water, it's a question. He can take it or refuse it. So it seems like his decision is more connected with my offer. And so I think the best answer here would be period here and then semicolon here because a semicolon tells you that there's some kind of relation between these two sentences. I mean, the, the problem says we're not allowed to add words. If we could add words, I would add comma and so here. Thomas is thirsty, comma, so I offered him some water and then semicolon, he refused it. But we can't add words. Number six, Thomas refused the water although he was thirsty. This sentence is correct. Uh, remember, this part is not a complete sentence. If you put it in the front, you have to add a comma before the main sentence, but if it's in the back, it's fine. Seven, Thomas was thirsty, semicolon. Nevertheless, comma, he refused the glass of water I brought him. Eight, Thomas was thirsty, comma, yet he refused to drink the water that I offered him. 
Questions? Next page, 30. Nine mistakes involving connectors. The first has already been corrected. So we're looking for eight mistakes. You can add words, you can take out words, but you cannot change word order or punctuation. Very interesting. So we can't change the punctuation. Ah, so the punctuation will be the key. OK, starting from the middle of line two. There were simply no parking places anywhere near the campus, so I had to park in the downtown mall. When I finished class, I walked back to the mall. Therefore, I couldn't. No, no, no. Why is there is no reasoning here? Therefore, it doesn't belong. This should be however. However, I couldn't remember where I'd parked my car. Believe it or not, it took me 45 minutes to find it. I've had enough of this. In Chinese, we say so go to. Yet I've decided that I'm going to send my car. OK, so this should be so. So I've decided that I'm going to send my car to a new home in the suburbs. I used to think that a car was the most wonderful thing in the world. I loved the freedom of being able to drive to my job or to the college whenever I wanted. To cut down on costs, I joined a carpool with four other people. OK, so this is a very hard transition. These two sentences say that cars are great. But this sentence says that the author joins a carpool, which means uh, getting in a car with other people. In Chinese, we call this gongchen. So apparently a car is not great enough. There is a transition here. I think we should add but. But to cut down on costs, I joined a carpool with four other people. OK, so the word carpool, pool, we think of a swimming pool. But the original meaning of the word pool is somewhere you put a lot of something. A swimming pool is a pool of water where you can swim. It's where you put a lot of water. So a carpool is a car where you put a lot of people. The carpool, I, you guys probably know this word, right? From watching James Corden's carpool karaoke. Anyone? No, OK. The carpool was OK. Oh, we can't change punctuation. OK, so this should be changed. Uh, again, I would change it to but. But is a great word. We can use it a lot. It's no problem. But I didn't like having to wait around when my carpool members weren't ready to leave. Consequently, I started driving alone, and that worked really well for a while. OK, so this should be however again. Hmm, should it be however? It, OK, let's look at the logic of this sentence. I've recently changed my mind about owning a car. Now it's clear to me that there are just too many disadvantages to having a car in town. So having a car is a bad thing. Oh, oh, I see what's going on. OK, so when she when the author is it a man or a woman? No idea. OK, so when the author is talking about joining a carpool. The car being used is the author's car. So that's why they have to wait for the other members because the, they're the one driving. OK, so that means there is no transition here. This is a uh, good as it is. Uh, because it, the author is still driving their own car. The actual transition comes here. However, I've changed my mind about owning a car. For example, OK, OK. Uh, sitting stalled in your car in a traffic jam is stressful. And because there's uh, only one comma in front, nothing behind. This should be a coordinating conjunction and it's a phenomenal waste of time. Phenomenal here just means great. A big waste of time. Whereas there's always the chance my car will be vandalized. Hmm. I would change this to moreover. 
Um, so here she, the author is saying why owning a car is a bad idea. Here it's another reason why it's a bad idea. There's always the chance my car will be vandalized. So somebody will like break my car or like, uh, you know, scratch my car when I park it on the city streets. So in front and behind are both reasons against owning a car. So it should be something like moreover or in addition. I have to park on the streets because it would cost me $200 a month to park my car in a parking garage. Nonetheless, that's probably wrong. Let's read. I've decided to leave my car and my cousin Brent's house in the suburbs. Right, so this is wrong. The author has decided to not keep their car in town, just like they were thinking about. So this is not a transition. It's not a change in direction. This is probably something like therefore. Thus, I've decided to leave my car as my, at my cousin Brent's house in the suburbs, not in town. Otherwise, I'll end up going broke, paying for parking and a course in memory improvement. That's a good sentence. My car will have a good home and I would use it just for longer trips. When I'm in the city, though, I'll take the bus or the tram. Otherwise, I'll walk. This should be or, or I'll walk. They say you can meet some interesting people on the bus. Maybe I'll find the love of my life. My only problem will be remembering which bus to take. OK, how many mistakes is that? Was that eight? Yeah, OK, great, we got them all. Questions about this page? OK, moving on, 31. <laughs> five sentences are good, five sentences are not good. OK. This sentence is it has a problem. There is no subject. Announcing that Abner Gray is our new director of customer satisfaction. This is what is being announced. Effective immediately, there is no subject. So this should probably be something like, I am announcing that blah, blah, blah. Abner brings a wealth of experience to our company. Good sentence. He served as assistant VP of marketing. This is vice president, Fu Li, Fu Zong, uh, of marketing for Antarctic Icebergs Inc. until last year when the cold finally became too much for him. I think that's a good sentence. His first task is to introduce himself to every customer. And, uh, and to find out. So no comma to introduce himself to every customer and to find out what has been done in the past and how our relationship may be improved. Expect a phone call or a personal visit from him soon. Good. Recognizing that our previous director was not always attentive to your needs, occupied as she was with the lawsuit, prison, and so forth, we have told Amner to work at least 90 hours per week. I think that's a good sentence. So here's a point of grammar. As she was, uh, you can you can move this to the front. As she was occupied with, which means because she was occupied with. No more embezzlement either. Okay, technically there should be a comma here, but I don't know if this counts as a big enough mistake. Uh, we know that when you end a sentence with to, T-O-O, there should be a comma in front. There should also be a comma in front if you end the sentence with either. Abner is completely honest. Uh, semicolon here. I can't highlight it. Semicolon. He considers integrity his middle name. Call him whenever you have a problem. 
you will not be disappointed. Period. OK, so these two sentences go together, right? Call him whenever you have a problem, you will not be disappointed. So uh, when you have a problem, semicolon, lowercase y, you will not be disappointed, period, capital F, furthermore, Abner will actually anticipate your needs. Rest assured that this director of customer satisfaction will never see the inside of a jail cell. Sincerely, Vicky Koppel. Questions? All right, page 32, last page of last week's homework. Ten mistakes. It says a misused word, so that it's probably word usage. There are ten mistakes. Lloyd Demos dies at 81, specialized in ancient Egypt. It's an obituary poem. A notice of death, public notice. Well, maybe not public. Obituaries uh, may not always. No, obituaries are always public. It's a public notice of death. Lloyd Demos died yesterday as he was pursuing. This should be further, further study. Uh, in ancient Egyptian culture, farther and further. These two words are very similar, but usually. Uh, if we're talking about a physical distance, an actual distance, you can use either word. But if you're talking about a metaphorical distance, be you sound the, then it should be further. Further study means even more study. There is no actual di uh, distance. Demos, who affected, this is A, not E, A F F E C T E D, affected. The lives of many residents of our town had a lot is two words. A lot of varied interests. Demos should have been famous, but he was very shy. He knew 12 languages, including ancient Egyptian. Being that, OK. Uh, being that is not very formal. This could be a mistake depending on how strict the textbook author is. A better beginning would be since or like because. He spent much time studying Egyptian grammar. His writing was always. All right is two words, all A L L and right. Demos had just sat down, had just sat down to supper. Supper is dinner. Uh, when the grim reaper death appeared at his door. Regardless. Take out the IR regardless. Demos insisted on finishing his mass pota uh, mashed potatoes. Maring shuni. Though he was heard to say, I would like to lie down for a while. Demos, who wrote over 50 books, will be fondly remembered. Do you guys need me to talk about why this is lie? OK. So I'll try not to confuse you too much. If the subject itself, or if the subject of the sentence is doing the action, then the word is lie, lay, lane. Um, if the subject is doing the action to the object, It is lay, laid, laid. I think that's right. You might want to double check, but that's what I remember. 
So if there is no object, it is lie lay lane. If there is an object, it is lay laid laid. Okay, other questions about this page? All right, uh, that's the homework. Um, you guys want an early break? Yeah, let's break for 10 minutes. So please come back when the bell rings.
So the last unit of this semester will be about complex sentences. And we're going to be using a textbook. Um, it's called Style, Lessons in Clarity and Grace. You can find it on Moodle. I put it here, Bizup and Williams 2014 style. It's a big file. I'm not sure why, but the, the file is very big. Um, this entire book is amazing. If you want to go from a, a good writer to a great writer, this is a very good book that you can study yourself if you want. Um, each chapter focuses on a specific concept. Chapter one is the introduction, uh, explaining what exactly style is. Chapter two is about the importance of being correct, basically grammar and accuracy, uh, which is what our course is about. And then chapter three, beginning in chapter three, there are ways to improve your writing. So chapter three is about uh, finding your main verb. Which word should you choose as the verb of your sentence? Chapter four is about your subjects and objects. Which words should you use as subject and object? Chapter five is about cohesion and coherence. Cohesion means that one sentence follows another, that it flows smoothly. Coherence is about making sure that everything fits together because it's possible that each sentence can follow the next and then you end up somewhere that is very different from where you began. So these both are important concepts. Chapter six is about emphasis and they misspelled this word in the uh, table of contents. Chapter seven is about motivation. How do you get your reader to want to keep reading? Chapter eight is about global coherence. So not just within each sentence and within each paragraph, but how do you make your entire essay coherent? How do you make it fit together? Chapter nine is about concision, which means being shorter and briefer without losing your meaning. And then we're going to talk about chapters 10 and 11. Shape and elegance, yo ya. Uh, and then chapter 12 is about the ethics of style, how you can use and misuse all of these ideas in your writing. Um, so, you know, if you want to improve your writing, this is a good book to study. Shape, the shape of a long sentence. I'm just going to say right now that in the in this unit, we're going to spend two weeks. There are no standard answers. There are different ways to simplify complex sentences depending on uh, what you think is important in these sentences. So these are just some ideas. We need to understand shape and elegance because it's important to be able to read and write longer sentences. Even if you don't write longer sentences, the things that you read will have longer sentences, so you should be able to understand them. Um, so how can we make sure that our longer sentences make sense? Here is a bad example that the author will turn into a good example later. So let's look at the original version. In addition to differences in ethnicity or religion that have for centuries plagued Sunnis and Shiites, this is Shini Pai Gen Shi Ye Pai of Islam, explanations of the causes of their distrust must include all of the other social, economic, and cultural conflicts that have plagued them that are rooted in a troubled history that extends 1300 years into the past. Bleh. It's a terrible sentence, and it is one sentence. Um, we can very quickly look at the structure. The main subject is explanations. Explanations of the causes of their distrust is the subject, and the verb is must include. It's a very abstract, very vague verb. What you don't have a picture when you see the word include. And what does that mean? Explanations must include. How does that build a, 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 a clear and meaningful sentence? So let's look at how the author improves this sentence 
and then we'll look at how he does it. This is the improved version. To explain why Sunnis and Shiites distrust one another today, historians must study not only age-old religious differences, but all the other social, economic, and cultural conflicts that have plagued their 1300 years of troubled history. Isn't that much better? Why? Well, the author says that in order to fix this kind of sentence, you should first break it up into sections, each with one main idea. So here's how he broke this up. The, remember, the original subject was explanations, which is a terrible subject. It's very abstract, very vague. So the author added what he believes should be the proper subject, historians. You might disagree. Depending on the essay, you might be talking about uh, diplomats, you might be talking about political scientists, but here the author thinks it's probably historians. So the first idea, historians have tried to explain why Sunnis and Shiites distrust one another, one another today. Uh, this originally is explanations of the causes of their distrust of Sunnis and Shiites. So he took this uh, noun phrase, and he turned it into a sentence. Next one. Many have claimed that the sources of conflict are age old differences in religion. So this originally was. Uh, in addition to differences in ethnicity or religion that have for centuries plagued. So again, this originally was a noun phrase differences in ethnicity or religion. And he turned this into a sentence. Uh, again, adding another reasonable subject, many. Now you might be thinking, wait, the new sentence doesn't have ethnicity. Zongzu, or I guess Mingzu, right? It only says uh, religion. Well, if you think about it, Sunnis and Shiites are not actually different people. They are people who believe in two versions of a religion. So in the original sentence, the word ethnicity doesn't actually make sense. When you're talking about Sunnis and Shiites, you're not actually talking about ethnicity. You're only talking about religion. So the author took this out. Uh, and then the last part, they must also, they of course is the many, they must also, no sorry, sorry, they is the historians here. They must also consider all the other social, economic, and cultural conflicts that have plagued their 1300 years of troubled history. So originally this was, must include all of the other social, economic, and cultural conflicts that have plagued them that are rooted in a troubled history that extends 1300 years into the past. Uh, OK, so he took. These three relative clauses, right, that have plagued them, that are rooted in a troubled history that extends 1300 years in the past. He took these three relative clauses and combined them into one. that have plagued their 1300 years of troubled history. So we have the troubled history. We have their or them, right? Those people. And we have 1300 years. We can take out rooted in. I mean, obviously it's a you don't really need this to understand the meaning of the sentence. You also don't need into the past. Because the idea of the past is already in the word history. History of the past is just history. So he took out unneeded concepts and so he could uh, make the sentence more simple. So now we have three very clear sentences. That the author then puts back together into one sentence. The sub the new subject is historians. So he turns the first sentence into a subordinate clause. 
uh, to explain this, comma, subject historians um, must study not only, but also all the other. So many have claimed age old differences in religion. So not only this, but also the other stuff. So he he puts these three sentences together by turning the first one into a subordinate clause. And then using not only but also to connect the second and third sentences. So by showing us the middle step, the author can let us see how a clear long sentence is built on clear short sentences and then putting them together using basically logic. And grammar. So that's the basic idea of this chapter shape. How do you turn something like this mess? Into something that is about the same length, but is much easier to understand. And the author gives us a few strategies. So here are some reasons why a long sentence might be hard to understand. Readers have to wait too long to get to the main verb. After the verb, they have to go through a whole list of different subordinate clauses, uh, like, you know, that, that, and that. And then the third reason, they are stopped by one interruption after another. So in the previous example, we did not see interruptions, but we will see interruptions later in this chapter. Um, so the first one, wait too long to get to the main verb. For example, this sentence. Uh, let me tell you, the main verb is here. That is the main verb. Everything before that is, uh, you have to go through all of that before hitting the main verb. And the subject is here, first year students. So the first two lines are not even the beginning of the sentence. So here's here's what the sentence is. Since most undergraduate students change their fields of study at least once during their college year careers, many more than once. Subject first year students who are not certain about their program of studies. Verb should not load up object their schedules to meet requirements for a particular program. Whew. So this is what the author calls an interruption. It's extra information that the writer shoves into the middle of the sentence and is not. It doesn't have to be there. You can put it somewhere else if you really need that extra information. So how to fix this kind of thing? Rule one, get to the subject quickly. Rule two, get to the verb and object quickly. So how can we fix this to get to the sub um, to get to the subject quickly? So this is the original sentence, right? Basically. Uh, he he made he shortened it. He took out some extra stuff, but this is the uh, original structure of the sentence. Just put the subject first and then move all of this to the end. Right? It originally said since you can turn that into because. Uh, it's like taking the, the top and the bottom and just turning it around, flipping it. Uh, so you begin with the subject and then the verb immediately. Uh, you can take out. Uh, this relative clause, you can put this somewhere else. So subject and verb first year students should not load up on the object. Their schedules uh, with requirements for a particular program. And then this is originally the uh, relative clause here. If they are not certain, right? Who are not certain? If they are not certain about the program of studies they want to pursue. And then finally, this really long part comes at the very end. 
so when making this kind of simplification or clarification, I like to think of this as you can think of the original sentence as a tangled ball of string. Your job is to try to find the, the beginning of the string, the head of the string, and to pull it out so that the rest of the string can also uh, line up very clearly. And in this case, the string, the beginning of the string is the subject followed by the main verb and then the object. And then you find a way to put all of the other information afterwards. For example, um, originally this relative clause who is describing the students. You can turn that into something else and add the students back into this part of the sentence. If they are not blah, blah, blah. And then this uh, since begins a subordinate clause. Uh, and we know that subordinate clauses can be put at the end of a sentence, so just move the whole thing to the end. As the author says, if it has a very long introductory clause, try moving it to the end, try turning it into a sentence itself. Uh, but if you if it doesn't fit at the end, try to make it short. If you have to be put something in front of the subject, try to make it short. Um, and then he gives an exception. We don't have to look at this exception. So, OK, let's see you found the subject, but then it takes too long to get to the verb and object. So here are some ways to solve that problem. Avoid long abstract subjects. Avoid interrupting between the subject and the verb and avoid interrupting between the verb and the object. So what is a long abstract subject? Abco Inc's understanding of the drivers of its profitability in the Asian market for small electronics is the subject. And the verb is helped. And the object is it. So instead of you know, if you see this kind of really long abstract subject, try to find uh, the really important noun and use that as the subject and then put all the information somewhere else in the sentence. I think we can all agree that the really important noun is the company. The company was able to do something. And so that's how the author fixes the sentence. The company. And then it says helped it pursue, so it was able to do something, was able to pursue opportunities in Africa. So that was the end of the original sentence. And then the idea is that it could do so because of its understanding, because it understood something. So because it understood the drivers of its profitability in the Asian market for small electronics, the drivers of can simply be something that drives. Drive here means motivate. So something is what? What drove profitability in the Asian market for small electronics? This stuff is the same. We have taken abstract nouns and turn them into concrete verbs. Abstract noun into concrete verbs, and we have used the actual important subject of the sent uh, important noun of the sentence, and we have taken that and turned it into the subject. So when you make this kind of clarification or simplification, you do have to think about it. The author was able to see that helped it do something means that it was able to do something because of something. He, uh, the author saw that the logical relationship could be split into two parts. Um, another kind of really long subject is if you add a relative clause right after your subject. The subject is a company. The verb is 
is, which is a really terrible main verb. If you can find a better verb than is, you should always use that verb. Is is another abstract word. We don't have a picture when we read the word is. Uh, and then in between the subject and the main verb, you have this relative clause. Does it eat you one day? So it takes too long to get to the verb. So just like in the previous example, we can take these ideas and put them at the end of the sentence by adding back the subject. Well, the author tries something else. He tries first to turn this into a, a relative, sorry, a, an introductory subordinate clause. But as we discussed earlier, this makes it this makes the reader have to wait for the main sentence. So the best way to do this is to put all of that information at the back. A company is likely to earn the loyalty of its employees when it right we have added the subject back into this part of the sentence when it d blah 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 so originally this was a company that blah 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 is likely to now we have a company is likely to blah 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 when it blah 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 it's not a big change most of the words are exactly the same We've just moved things around and we changed the grammar just enough so that the new order has good grammar. Uh, and then one other suggestion is if the last part is still too long, just cut it into two sentences. So originally this is when it focuses on hiring the best personnel or staff and then trains them not just for the work they are hired to do, but for higher level jobs. It's still kind of complicated. Um, so uh, this part has now been turned into this part. And this part has now turned into this part. Uh, it looks like we're putting the long thing in front again. But because it's two different sentences, it's not hard to understand. So this part, again, the subject is these companies, right? A company. Some companies focus on hiring the, it's the same, blah, 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 later. Uh, for higher level jobs, later. For high, and then he adds this later to clarify the time structure. And then such companies like this kind of company are likely to, and then this part is the same. This is a very smart way to fix this because the original sentence doesn't say which company. It says a company. It says, for example, take a company. It's not about a specific company. Um, so the author doesn't have to care about preserving a singular noun, dan shu. Right, he can change it to this kind of company or these companies. It's the same. It's a it's a meaningless example. It's not a specific company. Um, avoid interrupting between subject and verb. So in this sentence, some scientists interruption because they write in a style that is impersonal and objective. And then the object, the, the verb is do not easily communicate. So this is interrupting the subject from the verb. It's a very simple solution. Move this part to the end. Some scientists do not easily communicate with lay people because they write in a style that is impersonal and objective. He has simply moved this part to the end of the sentence. Simple solution. Uh, but if the interruption is short, it's fine. Some scientists, subject, write, verb. There's only one word interrupting. It's OK. It doesn't really uh, make it hard to understand. And then the same for between the verb and the object. We is the subject. 
must develop is the verb. A core of knowledge is the object. And then in the middle, you have this thing. Again, simple solution, move this near the end of the sentence. Or you can move it to the beginning. This is moving it to the end. We must develop a core of knowledge, blah, 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 if we are to compete, blah, blah, blah. Right? The author just moved this to the end of the sentence. Uh, or you can move it to the beginning if it's not too long. Uh, there's one other trick. If the thing that you're moving to the end is very short, it might even be better to put it near your verb because it completes this thought. Look at the original sentence. In a long sentence, put blah, blah, blah at its end. So when you begin the verb, to put something at the end, right? You begin the verb phrase with put and you end it here and there's something interrupting this entire phrase. But if you put these two together, put at its end, the newest and most important blah, 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 it's easier to understand the, the logic of this verb. Um, and so this is something you can consider if the second half of that verb phrase is short. So we're starting to see the general principle. Subject, verb, object, put the long stuff at the back. If it's short, put it first, or even in front of the sentence. Starting with your point. Yes, again, find the most important idea of your sentence, turn it into your subject. And then the action that this subject does should be your verb. And then find the object and then push everything else to the end of the sentence. So let's look at the original sentence. High deductible health plans and health saving accounts into which workers and their employers make tax deductible deposits is the subject. Results in is the verb. Workers taking more responsibility for their health care. God, that's hard to understand. So like, what is the big important idea here? Workers take more responsibility for their health care. This seems like the main idea of this sentence. Under certain conditions, in certain situations, workers can take more responsibility for their health care. So we move the main idea to the front. Workers take more responsibility for their health care when, and then the author adds in what the subject probably is, they adopt, which means that they use uh, these things, blah, 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 into which, uh, and, and the rest of the sentence is the same. So simply by finding the most important idea and making it the subject and the verb and the object, it immediately makes the sentence much easier to understand. Workers take more responsibility for their health care when they adopt high deductible insurance plans and health saving accounts into which they and their employers deposit tax deductible contributions. Okay. I know that the second sentence is still not easy to understand, and it's probably because this sentence is talking about healthcare, healthcare insurance. In Taiwan, we don't have this problem. Everybody buys national health insurance, and the government takes care of that. But this book was written and published in the United States. They don't have government healthcare. They have different options for healthcare on the market. And so to, to find the best kind of healthcare, everyone has to research different plans, calculate different numbers, and figure out which one is most affordable while giving them the most protection. And so if you live in the United States, you have to worry about this crap. Right, insurance plan, health saving, what the hell? Uh, okay, 
So this explains how you find what is most important in the sentence. This, according to the author, is the main point. Workers taking more responsibility. And then this part is explaining when or how. Right, it's an explanation. So you should try to put the point first and then the, expl the explanation later. Right, the point first and then the explanation later. And this is a very interesting point. When you read the point first, you can actually anticipate what the next part of the sentence will say. When you read, you're not just understanding each word. Your brain is actually predicting what the sentence is going to tell you. So when you read the sentence, workers take more responsibility for their health care, and your brain sees the paragraph, and it sees that there's a lot of information to come, most readers will think, oh, the sentence is now going to explain under what conditions workers can take more responsibility for their health care. Writing a sentence beginning with the main point helps us understand the sentence because it's working with our brain to predict this sentence. Right, so the takeaways from this begin by expressing the point uh, in a sentence. Begin a document with a paragraph explaining the point. Um, so like this logic isn't just about sentences. Sentence, paragraph, section, the whole document. Begin with the point. So far, questions? OK, um, so here are 12 practice questions on your handout. This is page 33, but I don't think we're going to finish all of these questions today. So why don't we do? Um, let's do two of them and then I'll talk about the red. Do I have time? Let's do one of them. And then I'll keep going, uh, finish these two chapters, and I'll assign the. I don't want to give you homework. We'll see. Let's do one together. Number one, this sentence on page 33 of your handout, this sentence has a subject that is too long. How can we rewrite this sentence so that the subject is shorter and the sentence makes more sense? Explaining why Shakespeare decided to have Lady Macbeth die off stage rather than letting the audience see her die is the subject. Has to do with is the verb. Understanding the audience's reactions to Macbeth's death is the object. Gosh, you don't you guys haven't studied Shakespeare. OK, let's do number two. Number two should be easier to understand. An agreement by the film industry and by television producers on limiting characters using cigarettes, even if carried out, is the subject. Well, even if carried out is not uh, here is the subject. And then the interruption, even if carried out, would do little is the verb to discourage young people from smoking. The idea of this sentence is that. Well, no, if I explain the idea, that's that's already simplifying the sentence. Uh, I know I'll translate it. Uh, so in Chinese, the basic idea is. Um, uh, something like that. I know it's not perfect Chinese. Um, so how can we find the main point, turn that into the subject, find the related verb, and then finish the rest of the sentence? I'll give you five minutes and I'll call somebody to share your answer.
I'll give you a hint. Your main verb is probably going to be agree. OK, I'll give you another hint. It, the, the second half of this sentence probably will be the same. Uh, and your the first half will probably begin with even if. And the main verb is agree. That's my answer anyway.
OK. Let's see if I can find somebody who's still here. Wang Yixuan. Liu Jiawen. Tu Hong Wei. Hi, can you share your answer for this question? Don't worry if it's wrong, we'll talk about it together. Sorry, you said industries, right? Agree to limit characters using. Comma. The rest is the same, right? Yeah, OK, et cetera. OK, even if the film and television industries Agree to limit characters using cigarettes. Uh, I think this answer is pretty good. Uh, begins with even if. Uh, the verb is agree, and so the subject are the subjects are the film and television industries. Uh, this is a very good combination because there's no reason to say film industry and television producers. It's we should make them equal, right? These two industries. And if the verb is agree, the preposition is to, to limit. Instead of on limiting, to limit characters using cigarettes. Uh, and then the, the second half, well, even if carried out is also useless, why talk about uh, an agreement if you're not going to actually do it? Uh, and then the second half of the sentence, you add the missing subject, it. In fact, the subject is a no subject. The actual subject is to discourage young people, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and we use it in place of the no subject. Good answer. I like it. Uh, OK, so I decided I'm going to give you homework after all. Um, your homework is this page. Now you don't have to write. Uh, so it says like revise the sentence. So the textbook wants you to answer with one sentence, but I think it's OK if your answer is more than one sentence. So for example, this question two, uh, you can say the film and television industries are trying to agree to limit characters using cigarettes first sentence second sentence but even if they succeed comma it would do little to blah 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 so your answer can be two sentences if you want or more as many sentences as you think you need uh yeah so your homework is page 33. OK, so continuing the textbook, we have talked about subject, verb and object. Now we're getting to the next point, which if you remember is the rest of the sentence has too much crap. So for example, this sentence. No scientific advance is more exciting than genetic engineering. Good sentence. But then you have which is a new way of manipulating the elemental structural units of life itself, which are the genes and chromosomes that tell ourselves how to reproduce to become the parts that constitute our bodies. Just really long and you actually have two relative clauses. Not a clear sentence. In fact, the author. Shows us why it's such a bad sentence. There are actually four relative clauses. This is the good beginning. Then you have the first relative clause, which is a new way of manipulating the elemental structure units of life itself. You have the second relative clause, are the genes, which are the genes and chromosomes? And then the third relative clause that tell ourselves how to reproduce to become the parts 
and then the fourth one that constitute our bodies. So it looks really messy because it keeps on adding stuff to the end of the sentence without thinking about the logic. How can we make this sentence better, clearer? So first of all, you can try cutting stuff. But as you can see in this example, there's not a lot of stuff that you can cut. So another thing you can try is instead of using, oh, this is a new example. Yeah, it's a new example. Instead of using a relative clause that will identify, you can change it to identifying. You can only do this if the subject that is actually. No, no, you can do this anyway. Yeah. Uh, you can turn relative clause connections into present participles, ing. Again, it's not a big change, but you know, if usually our brains can handle one relative clause quite OK. Two relative clauses starts to get a little dicey. Three or more, and usually we're completely lost. So if you can make small changes to reduce the number of relative clauses, it makes it a bit easier to understand. So in this original sentence, you can take out this. Uh, we've talked about how if it's extra information and it uses a B verb, you can delete the whole thing. Same here, extra information, B verb, you can take out both. So now you only have two relative clauses here and here. Still not a good sentence, but it's better. Here originally you had two relative clauses. If you change them both into ing, suddenly you have no relative clauses. We can read to compare. The day is coming when we will all have numbers that will identify our financial transactions so that the IRS, which is America's tax authority, Guosuiju, can monitor all activities that involve economic activity. OK, so yes, like changing the relative clauses makes it slightly better, but it's still a bad sentence. The day is coming when we will all have numbers identifying our financial transactions so that the IRS can monitor all activities that involving economic activity. Uh, the author forgot to delete this, that that is extra. Um, OK, you also to understand this example, you should also know that the United States does not have standard ID cards. So that's what this sentence is talking about. The day is coming when everybody will have an ID card and the IRS can track all of your financial and economic activities so that you can you will always have to pay tax. Uh, another thing you can try is something the author has mentioned before. If you have a long subordinate clause, turn it into an independent sentence. Um, so this is uh, this example. Science, important to future, genetic engineering, manipulating genes, whatever. OK. Many areas of science are important to our future, but few are more promising than genetic engineering. That's a very clear sentence. What was the original? Of the many areas of science important to our future, few are more promising. Yeah, turning it into a complete sentence makes it better. It is a new way of manipulating the elemental structural units of life itself. It originally was, which is a new way of blah, blah, blah. And then the genes and chromosomes. So this originally said which are, we take that out. So just making a few small changes, cutting the sentences up, deleting uh, words that can be deleted, makes the sentence better. Uh, and then you can change to modifying phrases. I don't want to talk about this. This is too complicated and it's. OK, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll share the ideas, but um, you know you. How do I say this? While still keeping you motivated to learn. 
it's important to understand what's going on when you see this kind of sentence. But you probably will not have to write this kind of sentence. If your sentence is so long that you need these strategies, you should just write two sentences. Uh, so here. Which uh, sorry, I have not done in this sentence, which I could have ended now turns into about to do in this sentence. A sentence that I could have ended. So in both cases. It is a relative clause. But if you repeat the noun that you are replacing. It makes your brain feel like you're beginning a new sentence, even though it's the same sentence. And so it has the same effect as when you cut the sentence into two different sentences. When you're reading a long sentence, if it's one long sentence, our brain feels like we have to wait till the end before trying to make sense. But if it's uh, it, when the sentence ends, then our brain goes back and tries to make sense. So that's why shorter sentences are easier to understand. Repeating the noun before the relative clause makes our brain think this is a, a, a different sentence, even though it's the same sentence. Another strategy is. Um, also, here are different ways, right? So originally this is a sentence and a sentence. Here, true and lyrical has two parts, true blah and lyrical blah. Uh, you can even repeat a verb, resist, resist. And if you really don't know what else to do, you can just add one that. A problem. One that blah, blah, blah. Another way to trick your mind into thinking it's two sentences, instead of just which, you can use a noun to summarize the original noun. Um, economic changes, which. But here you have added this phrase, a demographic event. Demographic means related to the population. It's still a relative clause, but now your brain has something to begin this part of the sentence with. So the demographic event is the economic changes. These two are the same thing, so it's a summary. Uh, and then finally, you can also just use free modifiers, which we actually talked about in this class. We called this uh, a participial construction. Uh, so we already talked about this, so I'm going to skip. OK, um, coordination. We have also talked about this. We call this parallelism. Uh, yeah, So this is uh, the worst version. The aspiring artist may find that even a minor unfinished work which was botched may be an instructive model. It's OK, but it, it takes some time to understand. But you can try to find a parallel way to do this. Look at these uh, adjectives. Aspiring artist, a minor work, an unfinished work that was botched, which means like failure. Uh, it was ruined. It didn't work. And then finally, instructive. So many adjectives in this sentence. We can actually use these adjectives as structure. For the aspiring artist, the minor, the unfinished, or even the botched work, this is a list, A, B, or C, may be an instructive model. So this is how using parallelism can help make a sentence easier to understand. So this is how this is the original sentence. Look at all of these relative clauses. But this is what the sentence looks like after using parallelism. 
the minor unfinished or botched should and should not be done. Continuing, the daily fare which provide good, honest nourishment and which can lead to appreciation of A or B pleasures. So by using these parallel structures, it actually makes the sentence easier to understand. Uh, and then when you do this kind of structure, try to begin with the short and then end with the long. So if you look at this sentence between A and B, you have to work through this whole thing before you get to B. It's easier and better to put the shorter one first. Between A and B, A and B. Uh, and in fact, short to long is a unifying principle. We've everything we've talked about before actually follows this principle. Put the short things first and then go longer and longer as you get to the end of the sentence. Start with information we already know and then add new information. Uh, yeah, and then so here you have more points about parallelism, how the grammar has to match. Right, that, that, or ing, ing. Um, but if you if they don't match, put the longer one second. Right, short, short, long. Uh, sometimes your connections don't work. This should be because, this should be but. You can't just use and. It's not Chinese. Uh, and sometimes you're not sure what you're actually saying. And that here, we're not sure what the and connects to. What is and what is what is supposed to come in front of the and? Which part of the sentence is being connected here is unclear. If you have this kind of situation, you should rewrite. Yeah, OK, so we have finished this chapter. Uh, next week, we're going to finish the, the other chapter. Uh, and then we're going to do all of the practice questions. Um, and your homework is page 33. Questions? All right, see you next week.